There was once a king who had a long and happy reign, but his favourite place was not his many palaces, it was his old apple orchard, and there he used to sit whenever he could get away from the affairs of state, and in the spring he would watch the foaming pink blossoms cover the trees. In the summer, all was green with leaves and new-formed fruit. And in the autumn, he tasted the golden juice of his apples. Even in the winter, he would go to the apple orchard and he would admire the criss-cross pattern of the branches against the winter sky. The criss-cross pattern of the shadows of the branches upon the snow. But perhaps his favourite time of year was in the autumn, when he could pluck an apple with his own hands and feed it to his favourite war horse. So year after year, the king would watch the turning of the seasons, the turning of the year itself. One evening, he was sitting in the palace and everybody was at the evening meal. And the king sat there, the banquet taking place all around his happy, smiling courtiers. And he noticed something shining on his soup. And he took his dagger and with the point he lifted it out and there it was, glimmering in the candlelight. And it was a hair. And the king, he thumped the table. Bring me the cock! And everybody was astonished. They had never seen their king angry before. They had never seen him lose his temper before. The cook stood trembling before him. And the old king looked up into the cook's face and he saw a young man. A man with a shock of thick black curly hair. And he looked at the hair he had found in his suit and it was silver and the king realized that this wasn't the cook's hair it was his own and all those years watching the seasons turning in his orchard he had seen the seasons but he hadn't seen the passing of time and the king realized that he was old and his thoughts turned to which of his children would rule when he had gone. He had three children. He was proud of them all. So he couldn't decide who to hand over the kingdom to. And then he had an idea. He would give each of them the same task. And that was to bring him the most truthful, and the most deceitful thing in the land. The most honest thing and the most untruthful thing in the land. And his three children laughed and went off to set about their task. Well, it wasn't long before the king, sitting in his private chamber this time, heard a commotion outside his door. 
sounds of a struggle. And he was just about to open the door when it was kicked open. And there was his eldest child. And the young man had underneath each arm struggling for all they were worth, the archbishop and the prime minister. And the king started to laugh. Very good, my son, very good. But which is which? Which is the most truthful and which is the most deceitful? And he laughed so hard he had to wipe the tears away from his eyes. And that would have sufficed. Except the following day, yet again, he was in his chamber and he heard a soft footfall outside the door, but before he could open it, it was nudged open, and in came his middle child, and the young man put before the king two objects. One of them was a portrait, a portrait of the king painted when he was a young man. There he sat on his charger with his flowing black hair cascading down. And the other object was a mirror. And when the king looked into the mirror, he saw a man with stooped shoulders, with scant silver hair, a face lined and wrinkled. And the king looked from portrait to reflection, reflection to portrait, and he thought, this is what I look like now. But this is what I feel inside. So which one of these images is the real me? Which is the most truthful? What I look like and what other people see or what I feel like inside myself. And when he looked at his middle child, the tears yet again were streaking his cheeks, and he said, Very good, my son. Very good, but which is which? And that would have been enough. But on the third day, there was the king, in the council chamber when the door burst open and his youngest child walked in past all the advisers and the officers of the realm and in her hands the princess was holding two horrible objects pitiful to see one was a blackened, wizened, twisted tongue of a prisoner that she had cut from its corpse hanging on the gibbet. And the other was the bloated, swollen tongue of a horse still steaming that she had just brought from the butcher. And she said, to her shocked father. Sire, I have here the most deceitful thing in the kingdom, because it is only we humans who can lie. And this prisoner hung for his crimes was the most deceitful of all. But here in this hand, I have the tongue of a dumb beast, a horse who has served mankind all its life. But animals cannot lie, and if they had the power of human speech, what honest wisdom would we be hearing from them? And so it was that the king gladly gave over his rule to his youngest child. And he knew that she would be helped well and long by her brothers with their wit and their wisdom. And so it was 
that the people of that land lived happily ever after. And so it was that the people of that land lived happily ever after. <laughs>
you have exactly as many spots as there are dandelions in the grass. Now let me go. And Lynx had to let him go. And she thought to herself, I have exactly as many spots on my beautiful coat as there are dandelions on the grass. And she was so pleased with that answer that nevertheless she decided that she wanted a second opinion because after all, more is more. She caught a field mouse. She peered at it through the cage of her claws and told Field Mouse to count her spots. Otherwise, she would be eaten. And Field Mouse didn't think it was the moment to admit that she didn't know how to count. So she dabbed her little paws here and there and she said, Oh, beautiful lynx, beautiful lynx, you have exactly as many spots as there are berries on the bushes. Now let me go. The lynx let her go and thought to herself, How beautiful am I? I have as many spots as there are dandelions in the grass. I have as many spots as there are berries on the bushes. But you know, a third opinion wouldn't hurt. So Lynx shimmied up a tree trunk and there at the top there was a hole. She reached in with her paw and hooked out Owl and demanded that he count her spots. Well, given that her claws were underneath his feathers. Owl didn't think it was the right moment to admit that he couldn't see in daylight and that he didn't know how to count. So he made little dabbing motions with his beak and then he said, Oh, beautiful legs, you have as many sports as there are stars in the sky. And Lynx let him go. And she was so elated with the dandelions in the grass and the berries on the bushes and the stars in the sky that she forgot her usual caution. And seeing a movement in the leaf litter at the base of the tree, she jumped. And then Cat jumped out of the way because there was Ada. In a hurry, Sister Lynx, said Ada. Not such a hurry as all that, Brother Ada. I can tarry a moment while you count my spots. Lynx didn't like to admit that Ada too was rather beautiful and she did know that snake is the cleverest animal in the land. So surely an opinion from Ada would be worth something. And Ada said, Sister Lynx, you have already been told that you have as many spots as there are dandelions in the grass, berries on the bushes and stars in the sky. I think three opinions should be quite enough. And Ada disappeared amongst the dried leaves. And Lynx thought to herself, Snake really is the cleverest animal in all the land because how would Ada know that, given that snakes are all completely deaf? And knowing she would have to be content for once, she prowled back to the river and gazed in her exquisite mirror at her even lovelier reflection 
until the mirror was broken by Otter, laughing with his pointy teeth flashing in the sun. But Lynx could now tell him how many spots she had, as many as the dandelions in the grass, the berries on the bushes and the stars in the sky. And Otter, he threw back his head and he laughed. And he said, oh, Lynx, that's right. And I wish I had as many fish in my river. And then he disappeared. And Lynx was left to gaze at her own beauty once more. Camelot. In the flank of the hill is a well. There are even stories about this well. People call it King Arthur's Well. They say that if you come here on Midsummer's Eve, if you dip your hand in the well and drink of its waters, that night when you sleep you will have a dream and in your dream you will travel beneath this hill. You will travel until you come to a cavern where sleeps the king under the hill, surrounded by his many knights. And in your dream you can ask that king any question, and he is bound to answer it. Sleeping as he is, Lying between this world and the other world, he will know the answer to your question. So if you ever find your way to Camelot, to King Arthur's well, on Midsummer's Eve, and if you drink of its waters, I wish you sweet dreams. I am standing on an ancient site. I'm standing on Camelot. The local people still call South Cadbury Camelot. Even archeologists testify to the fact that a great, great battle happened here in the Iron Age. If you look past me, you can see beyond the ramparts of Camelot itself, a flat plain and that is the plain where the last battle took place where good King Arthur was slain by his own son Mordred but how and why that happened is another story he was taken to be healed by his sister to the Isle of Avalon Glastonbury and when she had healed his wounds he didn't die, he fell into a magical sleep and is sleeping still, the sleeping king, the king under the hill. There was a farmer who lived at the bottom of this hill he was a very ordinary man with a very ordinary farm, except for horses. If he had the right horse, there was nothing that he couldn't do with that animal. And when one of his mares was in foal, he was very pleased. 
and even more pleased and even more astonished when that foal was born. A foal like no other he had ever seen. The farmer wondered who the foal's father was because this foal was extraordinary grew faster and bigger than any other foal he had ever seen. And what that young horse couldn't do. What a racer, what a jumper. at him with an intelligent and knowing eye. And how beautiful this little colt was, with its milky white coat like moonlight, with its silvery white coat like starlight, with its bright white coat like new fallen snow. How the farmer loved that little fellow. And as he grew, the farmer wanted to enter him into racing competitions, jumping competitions. There was nothing that animal couldn't do. But to enter him into a competition, the animal had to have a name. And the farmer hadn't named him and his friends teased him about that. Truth to tell, whenever the farmer had tried to name that animal, all he could hear in his head, instead of a name, was a rushing of pounding hooves, as though a great herd were stampeding towards him. And with that stampede, all thought all memory was washed away and the farmer couldn't think of a single name. And whenever anybody asked him the name of the horse, he just became tongue-tied and, and would mumble, oh, time enough for that, time enough for that. But the judges at the competition, well, they took pity on him and one of them laughingly said, why don't we put the animal down as no name? Why don't we call it Nameless, said another. So Nameless, the horse became. And he was famous throughout the whole county. But times changed and the farmer was down on his luck. Money seemed to run through his fingers. He was in debt. He knew that he would have to sell the farm if things didn't improve, but it seemed that his creditors were always hard on his heels. And he knew the time had come to sell Nameless. Well, there was to be a midsummer fair on the other side of the great hill. And the farmer decided to take Nameless and sell him at the Midsummer Fair, which also had a horse fair. And so that he would be fresh when they arrived, they left before it was dawn. And the farmer, instead of riding the horse, led the horse so that he wouldn't seem to have tired. The grey light of dawn was glimmering as the farmer and nameless skirted the great hill. It was so steep that no path could run over the top of it. So it was a long way round. And the path narrowed as it reached a great boulder bulging out of the side of the hill. And there, Nameless stopped. And he wickered, he whinnied as though in greeting. And the farmer could see that leaning against the boulder was a stranger. And he didn't like the look of this stranger. 
because by now the sun had risen and everything was touched with a soft golden light. Well, the farmer looked at the stranger and the stranger looked at him and said, Farmer, it's a fine horse you've got there and you're going to the Midsummer Fair to sell him. But I can save you that journey. And the stranger opened a heavy leather bag that was hanging on his hip. And the farmer, in that early morning light, he could see the glint of gold. All this is yours, said the stranger, in exchange for that horse. And when he said that, it was as though Nameless understood him. Because delicately, he picked his way closer to the old man and nuzzled him. And the stranger blew into the horse's nostrils. And the farmer did not like that at all. He thought that old fellow was unchancy, and he felt wrong-footed. So he said, that he would not sell Nameless to him. You're making a mistake, farmer, said the stranger. You may go all the way to the Midsummer Fair, but I can tell you now, you won't sell this horse. I can give you a good price for him, a better price than anyone else would pay and save you the journey. But the farmer would have none of it. He urged Nameless on, and then it was his turn to squeeze round the boulder, and somehow that old man, that stranger, had vanished. Well, plenty of people admired Nameless at the horse fair, but when it came to naming a price, somehow they all melted away. And it was just like that old man had said. The farmer didn't have a single offer for the horse. So he had to lead him back the way they had come. And as they reached the boulder where the path narrowed, there was that stranger waiting for them. And he said to the farmer, I could have saved you a lot of trouble if you'd listen to me the first time. Will you sell him to me now, or will you sell your farm? And the farmer knew he had no choice. And so it was that the stranger put that heavy leather satchel of gold around the farmer's shoulder. And then he said, I'll need you to help me a little longer. And he took his staff. He touched his staff against that great rock, that bulging boulder, and there was a crack! And it split open. And in the dying rays of the sun, the farmer could see that there was a tunnel. And as the setting sun lit up that tunnel that led under the hill, he could see something else gleaming there, something round and bright and huge. The stranger was taking off his scarf, tying it round the eyes of Nameless, tying another around his jaws. My friend, said the stranger, I will need you to help me lead the horse past the bell. It's really important that nobody touches the bell, man or beast, because it will ring out. Help me and you will be rewarded. Well, the farmer, he already had a satchel of gold, but he could do with some more if it was being offered. And full of curiosity, he followed the stranger and the horse into that tunnel in the dying rays of the sun. And then the old man, he raised his staff 
and it blazed blue fire. And the farmer could see that they were in a cavern. And beyond the cavern, there were stalls carved into the solid rock of the hill. And in each of those stalls, there was a grey horse sleeping. But one of the stalls was empty. And now the farmer knew why it was that the stranger needed his horse. Because there in the middle of the great cavern, he saw knights sleeping in a great circle. And in the midst of them was the hugest man he had ever seen. All of them asleep. And they had been sleeping for so long that their hair had grown silver white and cascaded over their shoulders, mingled with their beards, until their hair was like a rope of silver time in the midst of that cavern. And then the farmer saw the old man, the stranger, step carefully over the circle of those sleeping knights, lean forward over the one who is in the middle of them all, and brush the cobwebs away from his face, gently, tenderly, like a mother with a baby, and stoop down, kneeling, to kiss the sleeping man on his brow. And then gently, quietly, stepping out of the circle, he whispered to the farmer, take your horse into the empty store. And then if you go into the tunnel beyond, you will find treasure beyond counting. Take whatever you can carry and be gone. Well, nameless, was already stumbling in an enchanted sleep. The farmer left him in the stall, somewhat happier that he would be in such good company. And then the stranger lifted his staff even higher to light the farmer's way down that tunnel where more treasure gleamed and how the farmer gloated over it. When his pockets were full, he shoved golden objects under his hat. He picked up gold and silver coins and filled and stuffed his trousers full of them and his sleeves. By the time he could carry no more, he was almost so weighed down with the treasure he could barely walk and he stumbled from the cavern to the tunnel with the old man lighting his way. Maybe he was clumsy with the weight of his treasure. Maybe he was that much larger with the bulk of it. Or maybe he just forgot because he didn't squeeze past that great bell without touching it. And the bell rang out. And in that sound, the farmer heard the crash of the mighty oceans. He heard the sound of the raging wind in the trees. He heard the voices of every man and woman and child that has ever walked this earth. He heard the cries of all the animals and the song of all the birds. And in a terrible fear, he forced himself past the bell and stumbled towards the entrance, the first stars of evening pricking the sky beyond. And behind him, he heard a great voice cry out, is it time? 
and another voice after cry out in response, It is not yet time, my lord! It is not yet time! And the farmer was past the boulder and onto the narrow path in the night. And he heard that boulder, that great rock, grinding close behind him. And now he was a wealthy man. The farm was saved. He could afford to buy any horse in the land. But what he loved to do was go to the village inn, which stands to this day next to the farm. And there he would stand everybody a drink and he would tell them the story of how he had come by his new-found wealth. Well, it didn't matter how many times he told that same story as long as he was buying the drinks. But in time, he and his friends drank away all his money, and he became poor again. Every midsummer, he would go along that path and he would go to the boulder and he would beat upon it and cry out for that old man to reappear. Cry out for a little bit more of that treasure. There was plenty there. Surely they could spare some more. But nobody ever answered him. And if you go to that inn today, you'll see an old man sitting in the corner. He looks up every time he hears the door open in the hope that a stranger will come in, a stranger who has not yet heard that story, because maybe a stranger would pay to hear that story being told just one more time. Young and old, you've been listening to a wonderful storyteller. And if you really liked it, if you've got a little money, doesn't have to be a lot, a little goes a long, long way, as they say. And uh, you can afford it. Just pop it into the storyteller's hat. Because uh, right now they're not earning at all. So whatever you've got, it will be appreciated. And I'm sure you parents will have set a good example for your children. Oh, it's lovely. I'm only joking. But it will keep some of us going through this crisis. And those of you that are self-employed out there will know exactly what I mean, and you're probably exempt. 